Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Welcome to another edition of Encounters. Uh, today is a um, pseudo-1984 documents, British involvement, Blue Star special. Um, it's, well, my guest today is Parvinder Singh, who's a uh, journalist, independent journalist. He's also a member of the National Union of Journalists um, and is author of um, 1984, The Crystal Nacht, the document that was released uh, for the 25th that's um, right. Um, anniversary. Anniversary of Operation Blue Star and the 1984 genocide. Um, and also has now been reprinted um, with additional information and uh, additional sources. Um, but more importantly, at the moment, he's um, just tabled a resolution at the National Union of Journalists uh, com Conference, uh, which has been passed unanimously, seconded by another journalist called Laura Joan James. Um, and basically, this resolution was to ask the government of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, um, to order a independent judge-led uh, inquiry into the events of 1984. That's the entire year, not what was um, published recently, a few months ago, by Sir Jeremy Hayward, which was a narrow um, cabinet level investigation into particular documents for the month of June 1984, what this resolution asks for is an independent judge-led inquiry into the entire year, 1984. Um, Baji, without further ado, welcome to Encounters. Um, you're a journalist, you're uh, responsible for the production of this, the publication of this book. Um, this book, for me, uh, was the first time a journalist had gone out of his way to document um, the events of 1984, um, the where it was, the nexus, the the genesis, so to speak, of 1984, where it had begun, and why it had turned violent um, in 1984, um, and it was sourced, it was caveated where needed, um, and it was um, footnoted with sources and references from start to finish. Um, it was a serious look at 1984, whereas everything else had been polemic. It was either um, the truth or it was a propaganda revisionist's version of the truth uh, before the, this, this publication. Um, what made you do this, in a word, in a, well, to make it simple? Well, in a word, what was needed was, um, as you say, an official sourced um, documentation of the events um, of 1984, 30 years ago, um, which weren't in existence um, when I first published it five years ago. Um, there were lots of books and there was lots of um, information on websites. Um, so my idea was to bring all, um, all information together, yeah. but properly um, sourced um, in an authoritative report that was needed um, so that we can present this to um, journalists um, and the media to present um, really what we think is how it happened from the point of view of the victims. Yeah. Um, and the only thing we had before that was the official um, white paper from the government of India um, and various other um, reports. So we really needed um, the viewpoint of the victims. The white, the white paper dealt with um, Operation Blue Star. That's right, yes. And the run-up to Operation Blue Star was uh, July 1984. Absolutely. 85, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it didn't actually touch on November. Uh, no. And, um, no, but there were various um, news reports the Indian government brought out um, regarding 84, um, labelling November 84 as a riot. Yeah. Um, and lots of comments from leading congressmen saying, there was only a few people who died and we should forget about it. Um, so there was a real whitewash and subsequent cover-up to that genocide. So what was needed is to bring the truth out and, and basing it on a lot of the reports, the human rights reports that had already been written um, post-November 84 um, that needed to be brought together. Yeah, so, so basically your focus has been in establishing the truth Yes, um, Referenced and caveated so that 
it's unquestionable. The, the facts in that book are all referenced. There's no, there's no one can point a finger at that book and say it's hearsay, yeah. or it's unsourced, or there's there's no foundation to any of the claims made. Every claim yeah. has a source. Yeah. Has its there's reference. no ambiguity yeah. in it. I mean, even if you look at um, the information on June 1984, a lot of that information is based on another journalist, uh, Brahma Chalani of the Associate Press. AP, yeah. uh, he was the only journalist who stayed back in Amritsar. The rest of them were shipped out and there was a media blackout. Yeah. Uh, he was the only one who could talk to um, the survivors. Uh, he talked to the doctors who tended to um, the deaths and it was from his reports that we found out that people were um, had their hands tied back and they were shot at point blank range yeah. um, and there were Nazi type executions that took place in the Golden Temple complex after it had been secured. Mm. Um, so Up this to the 10th of June. Exactly, yeah. So this is one issue that um, you know I'd bring to the attention of the Right Honourable William Hay, because his statement in the House of Commons recently talked about um, pilgrims being killed in the crossfire, when really pilgrims weren't killed in the crossfire. They were executed once the complex had been secured. But they, they, were, they were also killed in the crossfire. Oh, there were there were obviously those killings, yeah. but there were a lot more that were killed after the event and also in camps There's as deliberate well. Deliberate executions. Deliberate executions. Um, and this was men, women and, and children. So it, it seems as if the government at the moment, our British government, is still taking the line um, that you know there were people who were just killed... Um, in crossfires and no mention of deliberate um, action by the by the Indian Army, um, who I think lost so many on the first day, um, they basically went berserk and took their revenge. Okay, buddy. Um, with regards to that, then um, you've alluded now to your your feelings towards the report of Sir Jeremy Hayward um, and statements made by the Right Honourable William Hague. Uh, in light of those, um, what are your feelings towards the report itself? Do you think, as a journalist, yeah. because, you know, the difference between us uh, as, as journalists as opposed to members of the public or um, politicians or, or Sikh leaders, so to speak, um, we have that inquisitive mind where we look at words and their usage and their context. Yeah. Um, having read the report, 27 paragraphs of it, um, do you have any particular ideas as to what you think about the report itself, its conclusions, and the way it's been addressed uh, in, in the chronology of the of the actual? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was a very hurried um, report. I mean, I think they spent nineteen days to put it together. Yeah, um, nineteen so days. And nineteen, depending on yeah when you think um, David Cameron. Um, yeah. I'm initiated the, the absolutely. I mean, all due respect to the cabinet secretary's team. I'm sure they worked day and night, day and night, yeah. um, to put it, this together. But to go through twenty three thousand documents, many of those documents would have been on microfilm. Um, so with microfilm, you can't search, you can't use keywords. Um, so it would have been a tall order for them to go through each and every document um, and to include them in, 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 in the report. Um, so it just seems as if it's very hurried. Um, and I think we are then therefore asking for a, a proper inquiry, um, a proper report um, that's not hurried. So, you know, an, a report that could take six months yeah. would probably be sufficient to Maybe go six through, years. or even six years um, to go through those those documents. Um, the other thing is that the main document um, that Jeremy Hayward quotes is not released yet. You know, the report of the UK um, advisor who went to India yeah. and reported back. Now, the British government's held that back for security reasons, so we can only take... Sir Jeremy Hayward's word that um, the advice given was limited um, to the to the Indian government, um, 
I mean, I'm not questioning it, but it's we we just haven't got the information yeah. as as yet. Um, the other problem with the uh, the report it, it stops June eighty four, yeah. so it only does a six month period from December to June. So what we're asking for is to that to be extended to the whole of eighty four, and the reason for that is there's a lot of um, questions about the role of the British government during and after the November genocide in terms of what they were saying to the Indian government and what they were doing. Um, and that's one thing I've uncovered while I was in Kew a few months ago. Right, the National Archives. That's the National Archives um, where I looked at the November cabinet minutes um, and they're, they're very interesting what they say about yeah. what was going on. But you've been good enough to share them with us um, here at Encounters. You've, we have the copies uh, courtesy of yourself. Um, the minutes of the November cabinet meetings, painful reading. Um, would you say, well, you, you have said off, off air, but um, there is a smoking gun here. There's the British government have been, well, they've been at pains to suggest that at no point were financial or trade um, obligations or, or, or trade um, matters yeah. were, were never traded with, with the lives or the livelihoods of, of the Sikhs um, in 1984. And at no point was that balance um, ever in the equation so yeah. to speak, for life and liberty and trade for the British government um, in a, in a by, by um, I've forgotten the word for it, by yeah. um, binational yeah. agreements and, and stuff. But um, the document themselves, I'm trying to read the documents at the same time as talking, but um, at the end of the day, it says, in, the view of, uh, in view of the importance of the British political and commercial interests at stake, um, it would be necessary to explore every possibility of pre preventing the march from taking place. Um, this minute refers to a march on the 18th of November that yeah. was scheduled for the 18th of November, yeah. um, ostensibly for the celebration of uh, Sri Guru Nanak's birthday. Yeah. But at the same time, it had every um, possibility of becoming a protest yeah. uh, in the wake of the genocide that was occurring in Delhi at the time. Uh, or from for the ten days prior to the eighteenth. Um, at that point, the British government clearly understand that the in, the Indian government would not be happy for this for this march to take place. Yeah. And to say something like in in view of the importance of the British political and commercial interest at stake, as opposed to the mass law and order that had broken down in in Delhi at the time. Yeah. Um, the wholesale massacre of innocent people, the rape and pillage of town upon town, uh, township and colonies and, and localities in Delhi and right across the, the country, the northern part of the country. Does William Hague's uh, statement in the, in, in the Parliament um, post Sir Jeremy Hayward's published report does that seem sincere to you now? Well, I think, it, well, in, in terms of commercial contracts and the inquiry that they'd led, only stopped in, the, in June. So when he was denying the fact that there was any commercial interest, he was talking about right up to June and he presented his documentation just on that. What are we saying is if you extend it to the whole of 84, and you look at these minutes, um, but the November minutes, it clearly in black and white states that there were commercial interests. It talks about five billion pounds worth of contracts that um, were at stake yeah. if the British government didn't deal with the internal Sikhs Is in this country. Is that not the same five billion that somebody like, for example, Tom Watson was talking about? Yeah, absolutely. He may well alluded to, to about that. about Westland helicopters. Yes. 
Yes. And they were mentioned in the, in the yeah. June minutes. Yeah, so it may, may be the link there. Yeah, absolutely. But that was denied by, by William Hague. Yeah, so. absolutely. But this is in black and white now. You can see it for yourself. Well, yeah, are the, are the, other, the other minutes um, yeah. go on to say, and this is the smoking gun, um, that this posed a serious risk. Export contracts worth five billion could be at stake. The march by Sikhs in central London, which had been due to take place on the 18th of November, had been banned. Yeah. It doesn't come more unequivocal than that. Mm -hmm. That that is c a clear link. Yeah. Between people being scared of of uh, describing what the hap what's happening to Sikhs in Delhi, uh, the genocide that's occurring. Um, Absolutely, I and mean, it's it just mind-boggling that the British government were obsessed with controlling Sikhs in this country when a genocide had just happened to their um, to, to their families and friends in India. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no mention of any condemnation of what had happened or of the regime in India. In fact, the opposite. Um, you know, it was it was all cozying up to the Indian government at the time. Um, and only, I think it was a year later, they invited Rajiv Gandhi to Britain yeah. and gave him the red carpet. They did indeed. Um, you know, can you imagine um, a situation where, for, I'm just comparing, say, the genocide in November um, to the Srebrenica massacre of Muslim, mainly boys, Absolutely. men and boys, in, 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 in Bosnia. Um, 8,000 killed. Can you imagine the British government inviting uh, Milosevic over, you know, Karadic, I think. Karadic and yeah. Milosevic over yeah. um, after that? Can you imagine them being obsessed with Muslims in this country? Um, can you imagine them not condemning such uh, a genocide? Well, and they yet, launched a war. Exactly. On the back of that. Exactly. And, but in this case, they were clearly on the side of the perpetrators. As opposed to the victims. Yeah, I mean these these minutes they are in the same vein as the earlier minutes that yeah. were disclosed earlier this year. Um, everything, when it comes to mentions of the Sikhs, is in a negative sense. Yeah. Um, the only attacks that are mentioned in these minutes are those of Sikhs on upon Hindus and moderate Sikhs yeah. in the UK. There's absolutely no mention of genocide. Um, these minutes were of the 18th of November, so Margaret Thatcher had been to Delhi. Yeah. She'd smelt the burning flesh yeah. that Mark Tully, the BBC correspondent in Delhi, had told the world that you could not go to any part of Delhi and not smell burning flesh yeah. throughout the streets. And there was press reports in this country. Absolutely, yeah. If you look at the Times yep. um, during the beginning of November, um, Clearly, reports coming out that the Congress, leading Congress members, yeah. were involved in orchestrating the massacres. Um, well, the Times, um, the London Times of November the third, nineteen eighty-four. Yeah. The headline reads: "Sikhs butchered in mob attacks on trains to Delhi." Um, Margaret Thatcher is on that front cover. Um, tight security as Thatcher leaves Heathrow, bound for India, um, and then you have by the by the eighth of November, five days later. You have the same sort of headlines. This is still again in the Times of, of London. Opposition leaders blame Congress Party for violence against Sikhs. Delhi suspends top security men. I mean, there was no sort of ambiguity. Uh, the world knew the from world day knew. one yeah. what had happened. And as far as I'm concerned, willfully closed its eyes yeah. and said, you know, what's happened is absolutely ghastly. Um, but it's simpler if we just pretend it didn't happen yeah. and let's move on rather than address it and then watch the disintegration of a, of a, of a nation yeah. which simply is not going to be able to come to terms with the genocide of a absolutely. people. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm all for closure to these events. I'm all for, I think, in Paul Uppel's words in Parliament, reconciliation. Absolutely. We need to get to that. But until the truth comes out and there's justice, we cannot get to that um, point, I think. Um, and also the fact that in a few months after that, The Guardian reported another report um, basically saying that the Congress the Citizens Party, for Democracy Citizens report, of yeah. Democracy report that came out in January, yeah. pointed the finger at 150 Congress leaders. members of the Congress Party involved 
um, in a plan to exterminate the Sikhs. And this was in The Guardian. Yeah. So they cannot deny that they didn't January know. 1985. Yeah. Um, he had already said whatever happened in Delhi was not an ordinary holocaust. It was an organised orgy. Um, that was said by V. M. Talkunde, yeah. the um, ex um, Supreme Court judge. Yeah. Uh, it was primarily meant to arouse passions of the majority community, Hindu chauvinism, in order to consolidate Hindu votes in the coming election. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's the price of a Sikh life, is the price of uh, a vote. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, in a general that's the calculation Indira Gandhi did at the beginning of November of, of 1984. Of June, yeah. Yeah, to, to take um, the, the majority block vote, and the only way to do that is to scapegoat the minority. Um, and that's how it happened and how we how how we suffered um so i think you know i mean it wasn't a hindu sikh thing it was politically motivated it was indeed yeah and you know indira gandhi and her son deliberately drew a wedge between hindus and sikhs hindus and sikhs in punjab and then the whole of india and i think we all have suffered as a consequence um sikhs and, and hindus both absolutely have suffered, absolutely yeah. absolutely this is not a hindu sikh thing no it's it's uh Congress Party organising a genocide against a minority, against uh, what you would say is the enemy within, something yeah, I think Indira Gandhi got from Margaret Thatcher yeah. when she spoke about her her miners and she dealt with the miners in 1984 as well, obviously not as brutal, well, um, but she grief. devastated mining all communities, all grieve, yeah, all the rest if of it. The, there's minutes that were, were um, made public not long ago, uh, maybe last year sometime, that suggested that, well, didn't suggest, they showed that Margaret Thatcher was more than happy to send the army in yeah. to deal with the miners Absolutely. at Orgreave. Yeah. Um, and in, in, the, in the event, the police attacked the miners yeah. unprovoked, uh, caused a lot, a lot of injuries, um, I think maybe a death or two as yeah. well, um, and then doctored their reports, similar to another yeah. um, Thatcher era d disgrace, mm. which is the Hillsborough. Yeah. Where the police then doctored their statements Absolutely. to suggest that the miners had attacked the police for yeah. no reason at all. Yeah. Um, so Margaret Thatcher, if you go as far as um, things like shoot to kill yeah. um, and the the um, John Stalker affair, yeah. Belgrano, Margaret Thatcher has done things that Indira Gandhi could do well to learn yeah. if she was in the business of consolidating her power mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Yeah. Um, when we think of things like that, to others who may not be quite up to speed with what happens in the world is in terms of the inquisitive mind of people who are looking at it from a journalistic point of view yeah. rather than a narrative. Um, when we think of these things, it's easy for people to think that they were conspiracy theorists, but these things are documented and they, they are real. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, the other friend of Margaret Thatcher was General Pinochet. Absolutely. And, and Pinochet oversaw um, a massacre of his own people. He did. In Actually, what we call now the first 9-11, which happened um, September the 11th, 1973. Yeah. And not anyone, not a lot of people talk about that. No. You know, it's just 9/11 at the moment. But the first 9/11 was committed by General Pinochet, backed by the CIA, yeah. and backed by the British. And then, and the journalists were the first victims there also. Yeah, even absolutely. though they were, some of them were American citizens. Yeah. Um, and the first thing to do was shut down the press, mm. which it always is. Yeah. And that was the original Henry Kissinger inspired 9/11. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And all these things they happen under the same watch in the same decades. Um, 73 to, to well, I'd say 1970 yeah. to probably 1990 yeah. um, but all of that encompassing the Saddam Hussein era, mm -hmm. the Iran-Contra yeah. all of these things, Reaganomics and, and Thatcherism um, it, it, it created in effect a new world order mm -hmm. of the time yeah. which kept the hegemony uh, in favour of the West yeah. um, and India was just a part of that and when we look at it on that bigger bigger scheme of things, it's not that much of a jump in imagination for us to think that that five billion or five five trillion is it? Five billion. Five billion. Which was a lot of money in those days. In nineteen eighties, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Five billion pound Westland helicopter deal 
it's not that difficult mm. to imagine that that weighed a lot, lot more than yeah. 35,000 lives, mm -hmm. yeah. innocent or otherwise. But Baji, when you think of these things and you think of how the British behave and how they've behaved with other nations, <coughs> do, you, do you ever think that it's not a personal thing? That it's not because we're Sikhs. It's just that because that happens to be the trading partner of the time. Yeah. Well, it's geopolitics, yeah. isn't it? Um, and trade deals and trade contracts trump human rights. They always have always and they always have, will yeah, be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the way China is now welcomed and what happened in Tiananmen Square um, back in the 80s that and 90s. That was the 6th of June. Exactly. 6th yeah. of June. Um, you know, that's all, uh, all pretty much... 1985, year anniversary. Exactly. Um, and, and the way they look at Tibet now, you know, it's all hush-hush at the moment yeah. with, with Tibet and welcoming China. It's the same, it's the same thing. Um, it's a it's, it's sad indictment of our democracy that, you know, the powers-to-be still carry on the way they do. So what, what do you think we'll ever get justice? What are you actually... What is your aim? For, for now that you've um, had this resolution passed at, at the conference um, and you're hoping that the judge-led inquiry happens, what then? What, what, what is justice? Well, I think, it, first of all, it's important that you know, the inquiry is extended to the whole of the year yeah. and more documents are, are, are released. I think what Jeremy Hayward did was within his remit, yeah. he could probably do no more because that's what he was assigned to do. Um, but the government really needs to open this up. Um, they've promised transparency and a fuller picture. They think they've given that. I don't think they, they have. I think it was a hurried inquiry, like, like I say, and it's, there's a lot more that should, should come out. Um, and I think then we can, we can go forward. Um, I think the truth, first of all, needs to come out. Um, Absolutely. Um, and I think awareness, really, of but these events the, the that happened. The truth in the documents we've seen, the truth's not in the documents. The only mentions of, of Sikhs and the Sikh situation and the circumstances they found themselves yeah. in yeah. are all of a negative connotation. Yeah, absolutely. So the truth, even if all the documents were released tomorrow, yeah. declassified and made public, you still wouldn't get the truth, would you? Well, there's another question we need to ask the British government, and that's why I alluded to it when I was talking about the November pogroms. What did our British government do in our name when those pogroms occurred? And what did they do afterwards? Did they ever condemn those um, pogroms? And I think that's another thing that will come out. Yeah. But um, in the documents, they're going to say we weren't aware. Nowhere in the documents does it suggest. No, no, I, absolutely, we absolutely. But as I say, it was all in the media at absolutely, the time yeah. and afterwards, um, and also to bring to the government's attention, if they haven't already, they should read the human rights reports. Yeah. The the one regarding the attack on the Golden Temple by the Citizens of Democracy um, by C. V. Takundi. V. M. Takundi. V. M. Yeah. Ta Takundi's yeah. report, which catalogues. Um, the atrocities that happened um, before and after, and also the stories in the villages in Punjab, you know, the way um, the army was um, dividing Hindus and Sikhs and communalizing the situation yeah. where beforehand both communities lived in harmony. They were, you know, deliberately doing that, and that's all in those human rights reports. And the November reports, there's lots of reports regarding what, what happened there. So yeah. I think in, a, in an inquiry, these things can be put on the table for all to see. Um, whether we'll get justice, um, that's another question. Um, you know, it's been 30 years, it's been lots of cases going through the courts and all the rest of it. Um, you know, but we, look, we look for justice um, as a form of closure for ourselves. Our scars, are scars of a traumatic type as uh, almost apathetical type yeah where we haven't actually suffered ourselves it's a perceived sufferance um, the actual victims sitting in Delhi yeah. and in the villages of Punjab 
will they, do you think, ever see justice? Um, that's a good question. You know, 30 years, I don't know how many reports, whitewashes. Nine. The, you know, you know, <laughs> and yet, the exactly, Namavati. and yet no action's been taken against the perpetrators. Um, because there's been this big cover-up. Um, you know, the police have been involved, they've been shredding of documents, their fire eyes weren't registered at the beginning. Yeah. There's been non-filling of, um, of... And mainly the witnesses have been, you know, um, some of them have been blackmailed, some of them have been threatened. Intimidated. Intimidated. Yeah. There's all that that's happened. There was never any witness um, defence at the beginning. So, um, you know, it's really unfortunate that these cases didn't, co you know, come and, and prosecute those people. Um, but is that is that the because of the judiciary not having teeth, or is that because the judiciary just not wanting to do it? I think there's was there a question of the judiciary being communal. I think there there was at the beginning in the Misra Commission. Certainly, they took a view that um, they, they took the side of the perpetrators quite clearly against yeah. the victims. Um, but I think you know, end of the day, the perpetrators the likes of um, Sajjan Kumar or um, Jinji allegedly involved in Kaitla. Kaitla in, in, in involved in the massacres. And they haven't, you know, been able to sleep during these cases, no. obviously. You know, they they've been dragged so to the courts. Seen to that. Yeah, they've yeah. been dragged to the courts. Um, and I think in Jagdishi's Taitler's case, you know, he, he would have ended up becoming Prime Minister one day. He's, he was you know, a, he's an ambitious guy. Absolutely. Well, he was. Yeah. And, and it's only it. five years ago that when the story came out um, and a journalist, uh, Janelle Singh, actually threw uh, a, yeah. a, a shoe at, I think it was the P Home Minister. Yeah. yeah, that it all, it, it all came out again about yeah. 84. And um, I think Jagdish had to resign from the cabinet. And then... Uh, he'd been given a ticket, I believe. He was given a ticket to fight in an election yeah. by Jindambaram. He was asked in the press conference uh, why he thought that... Um, Jagdish Tatler was a suitable candidate for election. Yeah. He says, well, look, we've all got skeletons in our closets and what have you. Yeah. And he just threw his shoe in disgust and said, is that all you're going to tell me? Yeah. That's more than a skeleton. He's got 30,000 skeletons in exactly. his closet. Exactly. So, yeah. And that reignited everything yeah. and um, breathed new life into the movement, if anything. Yeah. yeah. The movement yeah. for justice, that is. Yeah. But into on, on to your questions, you know, if we don't get justice, at least we get the truth out. Yeah. And we can try and make sure it doesn't happen again to any community in India. But um, in terms of a movement, um, you've moved the, the um, entire National Union of Journalists. That's 200 delegates voted for your motion, uh, seconded by Laura, Laura James. Um, they're representing 30,000 journalists throughout the UK and, and Ireland, England and Ireland. Yeah. Um, the work you've managed to do and move 30,000 people to vote for a motion. Uh, what do you think of the, I know I'm struggling to find the wording for this question without sounding, making it sound loaded because that's not my intention at all. Um, but the thing is, we have our own Sea Council UK. Uh, we have the Sikh Federation. We have the NSO, um, the network of Sikh organizations uh, led by Lord Singh. Um, these three organisations have been at the forefront of asking for the same thing. Yeah. The judge-led independent inquiry, the NSO has been a little different, asking for an international tribunal, truth and reconciliation, yeah. which will lead to, because what we're asking for is the truth as British citizens yeah. of Britain's involvement, whereas the NSO has moved beyond that and said there are universal truths that need to be shown to the world before they can be forgotten. Yeah. And that will be the true healing of not just the people of Britain mm -hmm. who have had the apathetic tragedy yeah. happen, visited upon them, but the people of India, yeah. who were the genuine ones that need that truth and reconciliation. And that the British government, um, as compensation, for want of a better word, for what they've acquiesced to in 1984, that they should then go ahead and sponsor this international truth and reconciliation. Yeah and actually apply the actual healing touch to India from for externally because they're not capable of doing it themselves. Yeah. They're not mature enough to do that for themselves. Um, with regard to that, we all we have from the government is 
the Sir, Sir Jeremy Hayward report. Yeah. Um, so in lieu of that, we were invited as individuals, certain individuals have been, um, to turn Downing Street on the 7th of April this year yeah. um, to celebrate Vasaki with, with David Cameron, the Prime Minister. Um, certain sections of the Sikh polity decided that it was more prudent for us to boycott that one event, not a boycott in the sense of we are now not going to engage with the um, political machinations of the UK. Yeah. But that that one event we should boycott because it allows the Prime Minister the fig leaf of respectability yeah. among the Sikhs for whom he's just shown disdain with not uh, entertaining a real inquiry yeah. and just giving us this whitewash and saying, now look, run on like little good little boys sort of thing. Yeah. And for want of a better phrase, you know, I don't mean to be patronising to the guy. But um, an equally sizable portion of the Sikh polity, well, not just suggested, they were of the opinion that we should to maintain engagement in, in the, the political um, scene of the UK and for us to have any kind of influence over future decisions upon um, inquiries or even terms of reference of, of inquiries to come, that we shouldn't boycott the um, the celebrations, the Fasaki celebrations in, yeah. in Downing Street. Uh, what's your opinion, buddy? Your own personal opinion. I don't mean you. To, I'm not asking you to judge anybody. Um, what I'm asking you is, um, what do you think would have been the best policy? Were you invited yourself? No, I wasn't invited, and um, I never got invited in attending Downing Street. Um, so um, no, no, I wasn't. Right. But my my opinion, um, I mean, I think there's still engagement with the British government um, to boycott one event hasn't stopped stopped that. Yeah. Um, I think what um, I think it was Lord Singh who who started the boycott. It was Lord Singh. Yeah. It was just one event, and he decided to make a stand. Um, I think it was an important stand at that juncture, um, just to let. But does the stand itself not really have bare significance if, if it's not respected by all? Well, the, the unity... You're asking for um, unity in a community, like any community, which is not homogenous. You know, we all have our different views. We all have yeah. our different organisations and Jatabundias. So to get an agreement with even five Sikhs, you're never going to get it. But any communities like that, all communities have different views. So to, to, to think that we all be united on a specific is never going to happen. Um, I don't think it's the end of the day. I think the boycott was important to make a stand. Um, but I don't think it stopped the engagement. But it, given, um, hopefully given David Cameron, um, you know, a, f a strong feeling in the Sikh community that what was given in February with the Haywood report is not sufficient, is not transparent, is not the full story. Um, and we are asking for more in terms of extending the remit and releasing more documents. Um, so that's pretty much my stand on, on that. Okay, but, but, but you've got the resolution passed. Um, that has now reached Ten Downing Street, has it? No, it hasn't. No, we're going to be writing um, a, a letter. Um, I mean, normally our General Secretary would write the letter to David Cameron based on the motion, yeah. which is to call for an independent judge-led inquiry. I know you, you're, this is our goal, Sanji's goal, um, is to sort of engage. It has been, mine has been, up until I began on Sangat Television, it's always been to engage the um, community outside of the sea community. Yeah. Um, because I, like yourself, have been of the opinion that we alone are not going to be able to change the government's mind. No, no. It's going to have to come from a majority. Absolutely. Who say that we stand with this, with the Sikhs. Yeah. We know the Sikhs. We know what they've been through. Yeah. We want to help them yeah. get justice. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. I mean, at the moment, you know, at the moment we've got 30, 40 MPs who are back in this. We obviously need more. Um, in terms of my work and what I would say to, to viewers is if they're 
involved in uh, the trade unions or they should join their own trade union and bring this up and pass motions in support of this. And That's another way. And conferences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then thousands and thousands more people will, will know about this. Um, other professional bodies that one might be a member of you can bring that up in your local meetings. The Bar Council. Absolutely. For our learned friends, um, they should be looking at the Bar Council yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of pressure now on political parties to um, take their stand on whether they agree with an inquiry. So if you're a member of a, um, a political party, you can bring yeah. that up in your branch meeting yeah, and pass the motion. That goes to conference and you can talk at that conference. and. You've got um, the conference season coming up in summer. Yeah, I'm you know, not, I'm not the Conservatives, three, Liberals, three Democrats, Labour, the Greens, all will have conferences. So, yeah. I, you know, if there are members of political parties, please push these motions to the conference and, and, and speak up because that's where we are heard the best, I think. But um, in terms of, of um, the National Union of Journalists, um, one of the most famous journalists um, who covered the civil war in Spain yeah. and things like that, wrote books, a very pertinent book that he wrote, 1984, yeah. a guy called um, Eric Arthur Blair. Yeah. George Orwell. George Orwell. <laughs> better, better known as, as yeah, <laughs> Better known as George Orwell. Um, you've got a quote there. Yes. From George Orwell. Um, it was written on the bags at the uh, part of the conference. Yes, this was my... Um, my bag at the conference, at the NUJ conference. I hope you can see this. And uh, his quote is, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. That's George Orwell, NUJ, NUJ member. member. Um, and the person who wrote 1984, um, which is the subject that we're talking about, but he, he's, he, he, his story was a fictitious story about totalin totalitarianism um, and how governments can control people yeah and yet Sikhs in 84 actually live through that absolutely their reality yeah. not only for 84 but for a whole decade yeah. afterwards with the theory um, of George Orwell was totalitarianism yeah. um, leads to absolute corruption absolutely. which is exactly where we're sat today yeah where the Ministry of Truth becomes the Ministry of Lies yeah the Ministry of Defense becomes the Ministry of Attack um, and black becomes white, and white becomes black. Mm. And that's exactly where India stands today. Yeah. And a genocide is called a riot. Uh, indeed, a genocide <laughs> is called a riot, yeah. Yes. And victims are called aggressors. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely crazy. Um, people that have disappeared due to genocide yeah. are called absconders. And they're not dead, they've just disappeared. We don't know where they are, we're looking for them just like the families yeah. are looking for them, mm. for legal reasons. Um, Baji, I, I thank you again for coming today. We're sadly out of time now. Well, thank you for um, having me. <laughs> but uh, if anybody is interested in um, more of Bhavinder Singh's work uh, and what, what he does um, in terms of um, awareness for 1984, the issues surrounding it uh, up until now, um, feel free to Google his website. It's 84 files. That's eight, the number, T, the uh, letter, uh, four, the number, and files. So 84 files. Um, you can Google that or you can Twitter Parji and stay in co contact with you. I'm sure you're more than happy to tweet people back uh, and uh, more than happy to have a conversation with reasonable people. Um, and that would be Parvinda66, P-A-R-V-I-N-D-E-R 66. Uh, and Parji, um, all that remains to be said really is thank you for coming today. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed the conversation we've had. It's nice to meet a journalist who is trying to reach out beyond his own community it's easy enough to you know write an article english language article for punjab times or this for this or yeah. somebody and get yourself syndicated it's quite simple um they are crying for us to to write for them but in terms of our work and what we feel is necessary we've not shunned it for any other reason than to for the wider audience where we think the impact is necessary um well, I commend your work. I always have done. Thank you. And um, yeah, again, oh, please come back. We'll, we'll see where this um, inquiry goes. Sure. Uh, if we get it, if we don't. But otherwise, um, we'll come back and we'll sure. have another conversation about it. Okay. Um, that's it for today then. Um, encounters, looking at it from a journalistic point of view, 
where we've gone, where we're going to go, and what we've tried to discuss is um, where we stand at the moment uh, with regard to the documents that are going to be coming out more and more frequently now uh, as people study the, the files at Kew at the National Archives. Um, more is to come. These documents that we've seen today um, have only just been found by Baji himself who spent time at Q and looking for them. But the smoking guns are there. There's no denying that um, trade agreements played a very, very significant part in the intransience of the British government's attitude towards the Sikhs uh, in, the, in, their, in their hour of most need. You've, we've suffered a genocide. We've suffered an attack on our Vatican, on the Siri Haramandar Sahib, Darbar Sahib, Amritsar. And the British weighed that up against the strength of a five billion dollar or pound um, trade agreement with India. That is what your relationship with Britain was worth in 1984. It's for you to reevaluate what it's worth today. Um, as Arm Admi Party says, your vote is worth more than you'll ever know. So it's for time for you to reevaluate what exactly your vote is worth and which government deserves it. But that's all from Encounters this week. Join us again next week. Vai Guruji Ka Khalsa, Vai Guruji Ki Fateh.